Hey everyone, it's Caitlin from Divers Alert Network, and we are back with another webinar. And today I'm here with our Director of Research, Fraka Tillmans, and she's going to tell you all about some of the latest research on COVID-19. We are back and with another discuss webinar. Discuss how um, this research has potential implications for diving. Hey Fraka. Hey Caitlin, thanks for having me. So as Caitlin said, I'm the Research Director at Dan, I'm going to put up my slides here real quick. I hope everything works as planned. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is COVID-19 research and the possible implications that might have on diving, uh, on the diving world in the future. Um, you have all followed the recent news and that implies that you've been up to date with all the government restrictions that you are facing. What you also have done is you're experiencing all the restrictions um, right now with stay at home orders. And I do know that some of the, you are really frustrated about that, but sticking to those regulations has helped us flattening the curve and not overwhelming our healthcare system and this is what it was all about so thank you everyone who has stayed at home and has has stuck with the local and governmental restrictions so if you want to stay up to date on covid um this is one way to do it and is the are the slides there okay um you can go to Johns Hopkins University to this page. I've uh, made a, a screenshot earlier today and it will keep you updated on the statistics on COVID and you tell, will tell you the confirmed cases and the total confirmed deaths um, due to COVID-19. What I am going to cover now is a bit on the basics on virology because I'm sure not everyone who's watching is a biologist. Um, so just a bit on the on the terminology so i know that we're all talking about the same thing then i'm going to tell you what we actually know about the disease um i'm going to go into the research during the pandemic and its possible implications right now um, then i'm going to point out what we don't really know yet and that will directly lead into what divers want to know and that we might be able to answer or not. This being said, post all your comments and questions in, uh, the, in the post. Just post all your questions and Caitlin will get to you, uh, to your questions as soon as um, I'm done with my presentation. We're going to do everything to answer as many as possible. We wouldn't be your diving safety organization if we wouldn't also give you some advice um, in the end, so stay tuned. What are we talking about? We're talking about a disease which is called Coronavirus Disease 2019, or short COVID-19. The virus that is causing this disease is SARS-CoV-2, which is similar but yet quite different from SARS-CoV-1, that was the virus that was um, responsible for the big outbreaks in 2002 and 2003. It is an envelope virus, and that means it has a shell or an envelope to protect its RNA or its viral genome. And the proteins on top of this shallow envelope are the ones that will attach to a cell, make sure the cell will make sure the virus makes it into the cell, and then will start using the cell's um, protein production system to replicate itself. What we also know is that it survives in surfaces for quite some time and it can be eliminated with personal hygiene, like with soap, washing your hands, and with disinfectants on surfaces. Those two links will be in the seminar description later today when this seminar is done, or you can just link to it from here. Um, this is what our risk mitigation team has put out. Um, it's very good information, and, and including the webinar from last week. So what do we know today? The symptoms of the coronavirus disease are coughing and difficulty breathing. Those are the 
the core symptoms. The coughing can be a dry cough or it can be a uh, cough with mucus or blood coming up. As soon as you experience difficulty breathing, this is a severe symptom. And that means you want to seek medical attention because it might be life-threatening. The CDC aim, uh, names a few more symptoms, fever, repeated shaking with chills, sore throat, headaches, muscle pain, a sudden loss of taste or smell, all those symptoms you want to watch out for if you suspect you have been contracting the virus. How does it spread? It is uh, spread through micro droplets or secretions from the nasal and oral system. Even after the resolution of the symptoms of someone who has been infected, this can still be contagious. So it means once these micro droplets get on a surface and you touch them with your hands and then go to your mouth, you might have contracted the virus. Treatment options, well, for the mild symptoms, um, it's really symptomatic. What you can do is you fight the fever, you fight the pain, and you take care of the cough. If it is severe symptoms, you will need supportive care. That means you go to the hospital and that can go as far as putting you on a mechanical ventilator. The duration of the acute disease is very, very variable. That means in mild cases, it is about a week or two to, to recovery. In severe cases, it might go beyond the six weeks that I'm stating right here. So what does COVID-19 do, do to the body? Um, I told you that SARS-CoV-2 can enter the body uh, through all offices, but primarily mouth, nose, and eyes. It targets the lung. So it starts in the respiratory, in the upper respiratory system, and targets the endothelium in the, uh, of the alveoli in the end. So it goes deeper into the lungs, and the main target is the alveoli, these, these air sacs that, will, that are responsible for gas exchange. It can also affect other organs and cause systemic inflammation, affecting the whole body. Um, it can uh, affect blood vessels, heart, liver, kidney, you name it. What I want you to take away from this slide is it disrupts gas exchange and that causes hypoxemia. So what is hypoxemia? The cause, hypoxemia means that you have a lower than normal oxygen level in your blood. The causes for that can be different or there are different causes for it. Ventilation perfusion mismatch or VQ mismatch is one. That means that your ventilation, so your breathing and the perfusion of your alveoli are not, in, uh, are not matching up. That means if one part of your lung is poorly ventilated but still perfused, you will not be able to get to 100% capacity of your lungs because the other part of your lung will not be able to keep up with the, um, with the oxygen that is now not coming through the poorly ventilated one. It can also be caused through a right to left shunt and all you divers are now jumping on it because you know what a right to left shunt is from the PFO. In this case, we are talking about a lung shunt. That means vessels that open and allow um, oxygen deprived blood to get from the venous side into the arterial side without going through the lung filter. It can also be caused through diffusion impairment, which basically only means there is a too long distance in the alveoli to get the oxygen and carbon dioxide across or hypoventilation, which means that you are breathing, you're not breathing enough or you're breathing too shallow. If you experience any signs or symptoms of this, that is fast breathing, shortness of breath, bluish lips or fingertips, confusion that is not normal for you, or drowsiness, you want to seek medical attention. This is severe, and these are the severe symptoms that COVID can cause and that makes um, for the very severe cases that we are seeing in hospitals. The recovery of that to full health may be prolonged. This is as I said, it is severe, and um, 
why do I want you to know all that? Because this is what the physicians are currently dealing with, and this is what research will have to deal with too. But before we jump to research, let me make one statement. Social media is not an acceptable form, source of information for medical information. So this being said, you've all come across all of these headlines in the last few weeks. Please be careful with anything you read on social media or in, even in the newspapers, because we don't have too much data yet. Early or preliminary research released in the middle of a global crisis can get up hopes, but it can also cause a lot of confusion more than clarification. So these are only some examples. I'm not going to go into detail on what all these headlines were about, but keep in mind if you hear something like preliminary or a case study or case series, this is not actual research yet. Those are ideas that are currently being tested and that need to be tested, and they usually have good intentions and a good hypothesis, but we're just not there yet. Keep that in mind. What is being researched is testing options for the virus. This is of interest for the global community, not only for the diver, obviously, so testing if you have the disease right now. There's research on immunity, so antibody tests determining whether you had the disease and if you have built up some kind of immunity, if that even exists. There is research on vaccines, and this is really big now, so we will see in a couple of months or in the next year um, if there are vaccines that are actually working, and they might be similar to a flu shot that will give you seasonal or permanent um, protection against the virus. There are treatment options that we're looking into, and those are antiviral treatments or, again, antibody treatments. Um, and what is more interesting probably for you as a diver is the infection control part in the research. So currently, um, new disinfectants are being tested all the time uh, to see which ones are more effective against the virus. Me, as a medical biomedical researcher, I'm most interested in these two, and I guess that's the same for most of you. So, specific to you, what are the long-term effects of having had COVID-19, and what about the, the fitness after COVID? COVID-19 long-term effects are unknown, and there's a simple reason for that, and that is less than six months of recovery um, after the first cases. That means it hasn't been around for that long, and that is why we don't see a lot of long-term effects yet. In mild cases, we presume that there are no lasting effects, but this is, I say presumably, because we do not know that yet, and I do not have a crystal ball, and neither do any researchers that I know, so next week I might have to revoke that statement. And there might be lasting effects, but for now, it doesn't look like it. What a researcher likes to do when he or she cannot find the answer in the actual disease is we look at different diseases that were similar to this. So what is similar to COVID? We're looking at pneumonias, so um, inflammations of the, um, of the lung, and acute respiratory disease syndrome. In patients that had SARS or MERS, so other viruses that were, um, that were affecting the global community a few years back, um, there is a risk of lung fibrosis, so scar tissue in the lungs, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, but we haven't seen that in COVID yet. Um, and then there might be heart problems. So cardiomyopathy or arrhythmias that the diver uh, that that people might develop afterwards and that will have to be treated how would that potentially affect your return to an exercise routine I'm not talking diving yet um, again in mild cases with a complete recovery we would not expect too many effects um, but in the severe cases with acute respiratory disease syndrome, 
and the need for mechanical ventilation. So severe case for me is being admitted to the ICU, being on mechanical ventilation, and then recovering. There might be possible lasting effects on your lungs, your heart, and your exercise capacity. So decreased lung function, lung scars, um, the risk for heart, heart problems like cardiomyopathy, and it might take some time to get you back to full exercise capacity after this. Good news is from the previous outbreaks, we know that once um, a patient has recovered and is going through therapies and uh, treatments, most patients have fully recovered. Sometimes it takes months to years, but there is there is a silver lining there. I can already see your next question, and I'm sorry, I cannot answer that in more detail. This webinar is not covering fitness to dive, but we're working on a webinar for you, and our medics will get to you um, in the next weeks working, uh, telling you all about fitness to dive as we get more details about it, which currently we just don't have. For now, I can uh, direct you to this page that our medics have put out, diving after COVID-19, what we know today. And the short version of this is, it is already a short version for everyone, but the sh short version of this is pages anymore when you return diving. You need to have made a full recovery and you have to have reached full exercise capacity again, and you need clearance by a physician. This being said, we do get another, a few other questions quite regularly, and one of them is, does oxygen help against the virus? And the answer is, we don't know. What I do know is emergency first aid oxygen is not suitable for treating a patient. If you feel someone needs oxygen, consult a physician. These patients, if they need oxygen, need to go into a hospital and because a patient that needs oxygen most likely will need other treatment too, which you are certainly not able to give. <clears throat> there is a lot of rumors at the moment about hyperbaric oxygen treatment and the disease. Well, at this point, I cannot give you any evidence that this might work. There are good hypotheses out there, and there's enough meat out there to start clinical trials and for the hypothesis to be tested, which is a good thing. And I just um, looked at clinicaltrials.gov yesterday. Um, there are six studies ongoing right now. We, I personally hope that there is a lot of good information and good data coming out of these um, these studies and that we will be able to give you more information on this in the near future. So with this, I, I have only talked about the things that we don't know, and that is quite a lot. So to gain more information, Dan wants to hear from the divers that have had COVID. If you are a diver and you have recovered from coronavirus disease, and you have returned to diving, we want you to contact us. We want to know what you've gone through, how your symptoms were, what you are doing now. This is the only way we can monitor and, and see what is happening in the diving world. We do not want and cannot make this data up. Information exchange goes both ways, so we do need you. Please contact medic at dan.org if you are a diver has recovered and has returned to diving or will return shortly. Another thing that Dan is very passionate about is travel and um, some safety advice following the pandemic. So keep in mind, just because the states and countries that you are in right now are opening up again, doesn't mean the pandemic is over. The risk of spreading the virus is still there. It's, it hasn't vanished. And you have clinically recovered patients um, that can still be contagious. So we still need to have social distancing orders in place. 
There is currently, and this is the real reason for keeping a distance, there are no vaccines out there. There's no immunity that has been built up that, to our knowledge, and there are no real treatment options as of right now. Precautions are still necessary. If you must travel, use hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes while traveling. If you cannot regularly, if, if you cannot stick to regular personal hygiene, washing hands and so forth, um, avoid big groups and crowded spaces and follow national and local governmental laws and be up to date on travel restrictions. You cannot travel if the country you want to travel in won't let you in. This one goes to more the operational side. So if you're a dive operator, you own a shop or you have a dive boat that you're planning to take out soon after the restrictions have been lifted, you want to give this a good read. Um, one is in disinfection of rental equipment and one is on prepping for return, which basically goes into the infection control. How can I limit the spread of the virus in my own operation? With this being said, I would like you to make wise choices. Wise choices meaning those that are best for you and your loved ones. Please comply with federal and state social distancing orders and stay up to date on the recommendations of the CDC, the World Health Organization, and your health departments wherever in the world you are. Avoid exposure. You can always safely assume that everyone is a potential carrier. So keep your distance and wash your hands. Well, what I also want you to do is stay educated and that incorporates some rumor control. This is, I think, my favorite slide on here. So find trusted sources of information and share only the information from those trusted sources. And even more important, discourage others from sharing information that is unverified. Where do you find trusted sources? Everywhere here. Please, please use Dan as a resource. We are a source of information. We are here for you. We have put out a lot of information for the diver, for the diving dive operations. Um, please use us, call us, email us. Um, all these links are going to go into the seminar description once we are done with this talk. And if you haven't taken away anything from this talk now, um, here's the take home messages in short. The pandemic is ongoing. Whatever your state has decided what they can open up, the pandemic is still there and the virus is still here. Everyone can potentially spread the virus. Early research is preliminary and can easily be misleading. So, Make a note every time you read something that you're not quite sure of, do your fact checking. Fitness to dive after severe respiratory illness, whether caused by COVID or anything else needs an individual evaluation by your physician. Save your oxygen kit for its intended use, which is diving incidents and near drowning events. And the curve still needs to be kept flat. So please, please, please take all precautions necessary to not overwhelm our healthcare systems. With this being said, do not hesitate to reach out if there are any questions that I might not be answer in the next few minutes. Um, Medicaden.org will answer all your medical questions. Anything on the operational dive operators site or hyperbaric safety goes to risk mitigation at dan.org and to reach me and learn about the research studies go to research at dan.org with this being said i'm at the end of my presentation i would go give back to caitlin I cannot hear you, Caitlin. You're muted. Thanks, Rocket. Sorry about that technical difficulty there. I was uh, muted there for a second. But uh, that was an awesome presentation. And we've already got a lot of questions rolling in. So I'm going to do my best to try and 
get as many of these answered as we can in the time we have today. Um, but I'll go ahead and start with this one from Tomas. He says, hi, Dan. Um, everything is about to change as soon as we can get back to the water after this pandemic. Will you be undertaking any kind of research within uh, groups of divers or members that have been through coronavirus? The simple answer is yes, we will. The not so simple answer is we have not um, put the surveys and questions out there yet, but we are very interested in everyone who has survived corona and is now back in the water or wants to go back in the water. Again, please reach out to medicadan.org and um, or call our hotline, the medical helpline. They will take take your name, um, note down your name, and we will get get back to you with more information. Perfect. And a couple of our audience members are asking if you have any comment on the recent study by Dr. Hardig in Innsbruck. Thank you for that. Um, so yes, I do. The what um, what comes out of that uh, that university clinic. Um, and I've, I've talked to Dr. Harting, he might even be in the audience right now. Um, so what came out of there was a commentary. It is preliminary, and he states that in the, in, uh, the article that he's putting out there. So it is preliminary data. It has scared a lot of people in the last few weeks. We've had a lot of emails going back and forth. So the real takeaway message here is this needs to be investigated and that is what he says so we have the first few cases they don't look good after six weeks but we need to follow up and that is exactly what you would do with any other um, pulmonary uh, severe pulmonary disease all right and uh, are you ready to move on for our next question sure so Jorgen is asking, um, since many people are asymptomatic and may not be aware that they have the virus, um, are they going to be at risk eventually with diving restrictions? Is this something that your expertise uh, warns a comment on? And uh, he also wants to know, will they have uh, lung effects that might be dangerous for diving activities? As I stated, with the with what we know from pneumonias and what we know from ARDS and what we do know now from corona, as long as the symptoms are mild, we do not expect a problem to get back to routine exercise or to, to getting back to normal exercise capacity. Now, this being said, this might all be wrong, and next week I might have to retract from that and give you different information. But at this point, mild um, infections or infections that you haven't even experienced. If you don't have problems breathing, if you don't experience the cough, then most likely that, that virus didn't make it all the way to your lungs and wasn't effective. So we do not expect that there is going to be a problem. Okay, and kind of a follow-up question is, that just came in, um, that's kind of the same thing, this comes in from one of our audience members named Paul. He says, very few or no officials specifically mention diving in their restrictions. Um, is there any similar activity or restriction guideline that they can use to tell them when, uh, that they can kind of use as a guide when they're considering going diving again? That is a tough one. Um, there's no no actual guidance or guideline out there as of right now. Um, Dan is working on a on a guide. On part of that is prepping for return. One of the links that I had in the presentation. Um, I don't have information on any any other um, any other rules or regulations as of right now. Okay, um, another question coming in from, it looks like Ramon, he says, do you consider it essential to do tests um, to see if we have developed immunity before returning to diving, such as like an antibody test? Do you recommend that people take those uh, to determine that they are 
immune before returning and kind of exposing themselves to others or? Um, me personally, I would not recommend going for full testing for the, for the whole population just for fun. Um, those tests are primarily for now for the community that has been affected or the healthcare workers that have been affected or don't know if they have been affected or have been working with patients. Those are the ones that should pr primarily um, benefit from those tests. It's um, not planned. We are not testing for have you had the flu either. We're not testing for other viruses or, or diseases. So um, no, I would, I would not recommend that for a diving operation or for you as a diver. Gotcha. And if um, those who have experienced the virus or had the virus, um, do you recommend them all getting a, I know we said no fitness to dive questions, but we do recommend people <laughs> seeing a physician to... Uh, we, we do see, that is what I can safely say. Contact your physician, contact Dan, if the physician is unsure about the diving part. Um, th this is important that it is a physician who is familiar with the diving, um, with diving physiology too. Um, and consider additional testing, which you will, you will be told by your physician. Get clearance from your physician. Full stop. I second that answer for sure. And uh, we're gonna go with one more, and this is right up your alley, Frauka. Sarah is asking, are there extra concerns with technical divers and high partial pressures of oxygen stress affecting their susceptibility to the virus? As of now, there is no research on that, and I would doubt it, but as we don't have data, I can just say, we haven't seen any extra susceptibility to high oxygen partial pressures or nitrox or whatever increased oxygen levels. So as of now, we don't have any recommendations for you. My recommendation is always be as prudent and conservative as you can. I know technical divers don't like to hear that, but this is the, the recommendation that we put out for for anything, really. Okay. Well, that looks like all um, the time we have right now for questions. So if we didn't get to your questions, um, apologies in advance, we will get to them after this rev webinar wraps up. And uh, just a final thing, I saw many of you guys were asking about gear disinfection guidelines. We put out a webinar on that last week. And um, a lot of people want to know if this video will be available after this stream ends. Yes, it will. It will live on our Facebook page, but we will also upload the video to our YouTube account. That's just uh, youtube.com slash Divers Alert Network. And uh, if you guys visit dan.org slash COVID-19, you can get a lot of our most recent updates on uh, coronavirus as it pertains to diving. And uh, when in doubt, reach out to us directly. Uh, you can get in touch with Frauka at research at dan.org, that email. And uh, our medics are standing by at medic at dan.org. And for any risk mitigation questions you may have, uh, feel free to email risk mitigation at dan.org. Um, that's all I have for me. Frauka, any last words? Thank you all for tuning in. I can't add anything to that. Use us as a resource and keep flattening the curve. Right on. Stay safe out there, guys. Have a good one. Bye.